a landing field, this soft, uneven clearing in the woods. Hardly a thousand feet long and only one quarter that wide, surrounded by 50-foot trees. There is neither the time nor the equipment to prepare this field for power craft. Yet, here comes the answer to the problem. The CG-4A glider, the first link in the chain of supply. Towed by a C-47, this glider is delivering urgently needed equipment to an advanced fighting group. The tow rope is released. Yes, this is a landing field, and gliders prove it. pounds of equipment brought in by air, landed in a field too small and too soft for even the lightest cargo plane. This equipment is loaded on a specially designed trailer that may be conveniently hauled by jeep to its ultimate destination. Many special trailer packed units are available, such as ordnance repair shops, field kitchens, field hospitals and so forth, and are available for use without a long, tedious job of reassembling. This glider will be on its way before long with a payload, picked up by an airplane in flight using the glider pickup system. This is how it's done. The first consideration of the glider pilot is the selection of a site suitable for setting up the ground station equipment by which the glider will be picked up. In addition to the factors which affect a normal glider takeoff, such as direction of the wind and length and condition of the runway, it is also necessary to have a minimum of obstructions in the flight path of the tug. After the takeoff position has been established, the approximate location of the pickup station with respect to the glider is determined. First, step off 90 paces from the nose of the glider, along a line parallel to the flight path of the glider. At this point, which is approximately 225 feet, a 90 degree right turn is executed and 20 paces are stepped off. This is the approximate position of the first ground stake, which allows the right wing tip of the glider to clear the left station pole about 10 feet on the takeoff. The nylon loop and leader is then brought up from the nose of the glider. The exact location of the station poles is established by the length of the leader. When the end of the leader is reached, two paces are taken away from it, and at this point, the first stake is driven into the ground. The stakes are made of angle iron and are placed with the open sides facing outward to allow the poles to fall away after the pickup. Then, seven more paces are taken, and the second stake is put in position. The top part of the loop is then stretched between the two stakes, taking care that there is no splice in the part of the loop supported between the poles. Meanwhile, signal panels are laid out to indicate not ready for pickup, one on each side of the station, perpendicular to the direction of takeoff. The station poles are then put together. loop is slipped into the spring clips. The poles are then erected. Now the remainder of the loop is aligned against the station poles to remove any excess slack, giving it a square appearance. The station is now ready for pickup. The glider is then turned so as to bisect the angle formed by the nylon leader and the flight path of the glider. The control locks are removed. Here come some passengers for the return trip. German officers who are wanted at headquarters immediately for questioning. Ready for pickup and with his passengers safely aboard, the pilot must contact the tug. 
If radio contact is permissible, the signal panels will be rearranged in this manner to indicate radio contact desired. The glider pilot makes sure that the station has been properly erected and waits for word from the tug, which requires its own preparation for the pickup. The normal pickup installation in the C-47 is the Model 80 unit, capable of picking up a glider loaded to a gross weight of 8,000 pounds. First, the unit operator checks the unit. He opens the ventilator, then turns on the main switch, sets the electric motor at low gear, frees the brake operating nut from the threads, and the level wind rollers are put at the down position. Then the pawl is pulled up so that it rests on the electric contact button. The cover on the arm control box is latched up, freeing the pickup arm located outside and aft of the cargo door. Next, he takes the hook from the carrying ring and pulls out about 10 feet of slack in the cable. The hook is slipped on the track of the pickup arm. As the selector valve is operated, the pickup arm lowers into position. Using the gaff, the unit operator eases the hook along the track, preventing it from slipping past the hook retainer at the end of the arm. Excess slack in the cable is removed with the electric motor. Care must be taken, however, that too much take-up does not pull the hook from the retainer at the end of the arm. The cable cutter arming switch is turned on and locked in position. This enables the pilot to detonate a charge housed in this container, which will destroy the cable and free the tug in case of emergency. Back at the unit, the pawl is returned to the down position and the motor switched to high gear. Level wind rollers are locked up and the cable is pulled to properly seat the pawl. Back on the ground, the glider pilot checks his ship prior to takeoff. Operations and visual check of controls. Spoilers checked and left closed. Trim tabs neutral. Radio on. And now the tug, coming in to check the station, spots the signal panels. Radio contact desired. Glider from tug. Glider from tug. Do you read? Tug from glider. Tug from glider. Over. Glider from tug. Glider from tug. What's your weight and what's the condition of the rope? Tug from glider. About 5,000. The field is soft, though, and the tow rope is new. Glider from tug. Glider from tug. Roger. Stand by. This one's about 5,000. It's a soft field. And remember, the rope is new. Roger. The first time a nylon tow rope is used, it will elongate about 45%. So the break time delay is set at five. Number four is used for the rope's second job, and number three after that. The master brake setting is determined by the glider's weight and the condition of the field. The brake time delay handle is turned counterclockwise into position by screwing the time adjustment cam against the time adjustment stops and locking the handle in the nearest slot. The unit operator makes sure that the hook and arm are still in proper pickup position. He then turns off the unit main switch and reports to pilot. Cable cutter switch on, sir. Ready for pickup. Roger. Glider from tug. Glider from tug. Are you ready? Tug from glider. Just about ready. We'll call you. Doors are locked. Fasten your safety belts. Then, and not until then, is the tow line plug installed. After checking the toll release metering pin to see that it is flush, the pilot unlocks the brakes and... 
Tug from Glider. Come and get us. Glider from Tug. Glider from Tug. Roger. Coming in. Cowl flaps in trail. Mixture auto rich. The pilot of the Tug, now on its base leg, increases RPM to 2550. And the power is reduced so that the approach for this type of field and weight of glider is made at 130 miles per hour from the right rear of the glider. It is similar to a power approach for a landing. In the glider again, controls and trim tabs are neutral. And here, in slow motion, is the pickup. As contact is made, the tug boosts the manifold pressure to approximately 45 inches of mercury. Full power may be used if necessary. As soon as possible, the glider pilot pulls up to normal tow position. Because of the deceleration and consequent loss of airspeed, the tug pilot climbs at an angle, bringing his airspeed to the desired 105 miles per hour. The glider must not ride too high above the tow plane, since this might cause the cable to lift the tug's elevators, forcing the ship into a stall. When the glider is safely away, the tug pilot opens his cowl flaps, reduces his power to 35 inches and 2,350 RPM, and continues his climb. In preparation for rewinding the cable, the unit operator drops level wind roller and forces cable into position with his foot. The main switch is turned on, and the arm is raised to trail position, just enough to stop excessive whipping. Arriving at its destination, the glider cuts loose. After the glider releases, the unit operator winds in the hook to within 20 or 30 feet of the airplane. The operator learns by experience to know the position of the level, wind, and cable when the hook is in this position. To accurately control cable travel for the last 20 or 30 feet, he uses low gear position. Next, the pawl is raised. The explosive system is now put in safety. The loop is reeled in to within 24 inches of the pulley. And with the aid of another man, it is secured in the burden release. dropping, the operator informed the pilot. Arriving over the rope dropping area, the pilot signals the unit operator by a short ring of the bailout bell, and the rope is released. To full retracted position, it is locked in that position by closing cover to a hydraulic selector valve. is turned off and the ventilator is closed. Although gliders are not new, their modern equipment has brought an entirely new concept to the airborne idea. Glider landings and the glider pickup system assure for the first time in the history of warfare two-way communication by air without the necessity for prepared airstrips. And with Allied tactics leaning heavily on the crushing power of swift aerial attack, backed by aerial supply, gliders have come into their own.
as one of the most important phases of Army Air Force operations.